Where are you now? Are you safe? Half yelling, I check on Mike, who is likely at the scene of the fire. However, he dismissively retorts over the phone, sounding annoyed. What's up all of a sudden? I'm at work. You know that, right? Don't call me during work. He grumbles and then hangs up abruptly. There's no way he could be working normally at the sight of a fire. Realizing Mike is not at his workplace, I am convinced of his betrayal and decide to carry out something I've been preparing for a while. I'm Sophia, 29 years old. As a nurse working in a hospital, I face many patients every day. I've always been known for being caring and helpful, and even as an adult, I enjoy being of service to others. That's why I even consider nursing my true calling. I have a beloved husband, Mike, whom I've been married to for two years, enjoying our life together in his company housing. Three years ago, I met Mike through a mutual acquaintance. At a gathering with a few friends, Mike, perhaps shy, drank too much and quickly became inebriated. Perhaps due to my profession as a nurse or just my nature, I couldn't leave the intoxicated Mike alone and ended up taking care of him at my home, despite it being our first meeting. The next day, Mike, remembering nothing, said he would take responsibility, to which I burst out laughing. I explained the situation to him, clarifying that nothing untoward had happened, and he apologized, embarrassed. From there, we started dating and got married after a year of courtship. Now, approaching our third year of marriage, we don't have children yet, but I believe that Mike and I can build a warm family together. However, recently, perhaps due to his busy work, Mike's weekend work has increased, and he has become more indifferent when he comes home. Even when we sit together on the sofa watching TV, he spends more time looking at his phone screen and often sighs deeply. At first, I wondered if I had done something to upset him and reflected on my actions, but finding no particular reason, I started worrying about Mike's health and began researching nutritionally balanced menus, making sure our lunches and dinners were even more carefully prepared. One day, my hospital was on a day and night shift system, and I was supposed to work the night shift. However, a colleague contacted me the day before, asking to switch shifts, and I ended up working the day shift unexpectedly. I had initially told Mike I would be working the night shift, and while I meant to inform him of the change, things got hectic, and I ended up contacting him on the day itself. I texted him, I've switched to the day shift today, so I'll make dinner and wait for you, but no reply came for a while. I thought he might be busy with work and focused on my duties until a few hours later, he simply replied, got it. Previously, he would reply more promptly during work and even use emojis, but lately, it's just been a word or two. I wonder if it's because of his intense workload or if this is just what happens after two years of marriage. Feeling a bit lonely, I rush home after work, buying ingredients from the supermarket, determined to make another nutritionally rich meal. Today's dish turned out exceptionally well. I plate the finished meal, take a photo, and post it to my cooking account on social media. Cooking has always been for Mike, but lately, posting the photos online has become a joy of its own. Minutes after posting, my phone buzzes with a notification from social media. <laughs> Someone commented right away. A cooking buddy I met through my social media account often leaves comments lately. This different connection from my work life is refreshing and makes me happy. As I'm preoccupied with these thoughts, Mike comes home from work, and I rush to reheat the dinner, waiting for us to eat together. Welcome home, dinner's ready. Was today another busy day? Ah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it was tiring. But more importantly, I heard you switch to the day shift unexpectedly. As Mike changes into his home clothes and sits down, looking tired, I serve the reheated meal. Yeah. A colleague had an emergency. Sorry for the late notice. I join him at the table, starting our dinner. No worries, it was last minute after all. Just try to tell me earlier next time. Sometimes I make plans to go out with co-workers. Ah. Uh. Right. I understand. As we talk, I notice Mike's chopsticks aren't moving much. The food, not so tasty? I wondered if it didn't suit his taste. When I asked with concern, Mike's hand holding the chopsticks came to a sudden stop, and then he opened his mouth with a somewhat awkward expression. Ah. Uh. No, not that. I just don't feel like eating much. Sorry, 
I'll eat it tomorrow morning. <laughs> With a wry smile, Mike said, thanks for the meal, and stood up, heading towards the bathroom. More than half of the food remained on the table. I just knew it. With that conviction, I decided to follow Mike, who had headed for the bathroom. Hey, aren't you feeling well? You've been lacking energy lately. I'm worried, so could you please go to the doctor? Mike, who was brushing his teeth in the bathroom, rinsed his mouth and denied my words with a laugh. I'm fine. Oh, maybe it's because I haven't been exercising much lately. I'm going to take a short walk now. Saying that, Mike quickly got ready and headed to the front door. I'll come with you. But he gently refused, and, increasingly worried, I decided to secretly follow him. Just in case he collapsed, I could rush to help him. Though I pretended that was the reason, deep down, I might have been swirling with a different anxiety. That anxiety was soon confirmed. Contrary to my concerns, Mike, walking briskly, stopped in front of a park not far from our house. He looked around and seemed to be contacting someone with his smartphone. Then, a white car slid up to him. Mike approached the white car and seemed to have a brief exchange with the person in the driver's seat. It was hard to see in the dark. I moved a little closer to the car, and my eyes caught the person sitting in the driver's seat. A young woman with long curly hair, giving off an enchanting vibe. The moment I saw her, my hands naturally reached for my smartphone and activated the camera. Mike getting into the passenger seat. The woman smiling back at him. I reflexively captured the scene in a photo, and by the time I came to my senses, the car with the two of them had already driven away. Surprise, confusion, suspicion, a whirlwind of emotions left me frozen in place. Then I received an email from Mike saying, ran into an acquaintance, so I'll be home a bit late. An acquaintance? By chance? The scene from before was seared into my memory, and I just couldn't bring myself to believe Mike's words. That night, Mike didn't return home until after one in the morning. My anxiety reaching its limit, I confronted him with the tears I couldn't hold back and the photos I had taken. Seeing the photo, Mike froze, then quickly put on a smile and claimed he had just bumped into a client during his walk. It was just a consultation, there's nothing to worry about. Trust me. Mike looked at me with a sorrowful expression, as if he was the victim, making it clear he wouldn't allow further questioning. After that, Mike's work started to get really busy, and he often had to work late, especially on days I had day shifts. Despite our increasingly separate lives, I tried to find time to talk about what happened, but he always declined, saying he was too tired. Overtime yesterday, working on his day off today. Really? At work, the image of Mike and that woman cuddling would pop into my mind whenever I let my guard down, leaving me uneasy. After finishing a night shift, the morning sun stung my tired eyes. Lately, I've been all anxiety and worry, not taking any time to care for myself, so I stopped by a bakery that was open early and bought some cake. Feeling a bit brighter, I left the shop and took a different route home than usual. This area has many hotels, and I often see couples who seem to have their own stories, but the air was quiet, perhaps because it was early morning. Carefully carrying the cake so it wouldn't crumble, I thought about enjoying it with some tea at home when I briefly saw a young man and woman leaving a hotel on the opposite side of the street. My gaze inadvertently drifted over, and I froze in shock. It was Mike, his eyes sleepy and smiling softly, and the woman smiling back at him, the same one with the long curly hair I saw in the car that day. The cake I was holding slipped from my hands and squashed as it hit the ground. Inside my head, which had gone completely blank, only a sense of mission to leave no evidence behind remained. With trembling hands, I took out my smartphone, crossed my arms, and captured the smiling couple. The two captured on the screen looked just like lovers. My heart throbbed violently, and an unpleasant sweat broke out. Mike had been lying after all. In my field of vision were the fallen cake box and the photo of the two. While gazing at them absent-mindedly, I thought in the back of my mind that I couldn't stay with him any longer. It was a day when my suspicions about Mike turned into conviction, and the word divorce started to feel real after a series of events. That day, I was busy with my usual daytime shift. While I was on the phone, I could hear the siren of a fire engine from afar, passing through the neighborhood. 
It was not just one, but two, then three, suggesting a fire somewhere, which made me a bit worried. After finishing the call and taking a breath, two of my colleagues who had been to the patient room came back saying, it's scary, isn't it? Hi, what happened? I asked, thinking there might have been some trouble, and they whispered, there's a fire at Company A, a patient we passed in the hallway earlier told us. Company A, fire. The moment I heard those words, a chill sweat ran down my back. After excusing myself to my colleagues, I clutched my smartphone and hurried to a secluded spot. The company A, where I had learned there was a fire, was Mike's workplace. Hoping for the best, I called Mike. This morning, as usual, I saw him off to work. Since the series of events, we hardly saw each other or talked at home, but I never missed sending him off in the morning. Please, be safe. As if my prayers were answered, I heard Mike's voice saying, hello, after a few rings. Where are you? Are you safe? I half shouted, checking on Mike's safety, to which he replied in an annoyed tone. What's with the sudden call? I'm at work. You know that, right? And don't call me during work. He said grumpily, and the call was quickly ended. Only the beep beep of the call ending could be heard in my ear. From Mike's tone on the phone, he seemed safe from the fire for now, but I felt a huge sense of unease. It's impossible to be working normally at the sight of a fire. Moreover, his words and attitude, trampling over my worried feelings, gradually fueled my anger. Mike must not be at his workplace right now. I saw him off to work as usual today, but he must not have been heading to his workplace. Ever since we got married, I might have been unknowingly seeing off Mike to another woman. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a swish of glossy, long, curly hair. I made a decision and called a certain person from my clutched smartphone. After finishing work safely, I hurried home and started packing up all the furniture and appliances. Then, the doorbell rang. When I opened the front door, it wasn't Mike, but a friend from college. This friend, aware of my and Mike's situation, had volunteered to help with my sudden departure. Despite calling from work and asking for help with moving on short notice, she agreed without hesitation. Thank you so much. I'll treat you to something nice next time. I said with a feeling of guilt, to which she replied with a smile, it's been tough, hasn't it? I'm always here to help. I felt warmth in my heart, which had been dull lately, for having such a good friend. Then, we carried out the furniture and appliances and loaded the clothes I had prepared weeks ago into the car. The room, now devoid of the furniture and appliances I had used since my single days, looked almost empty, giving off a desolate air. Staring at the room, I asked myself again if I had any regrets about leaving this life behind. No, I don't need it anymore. Without any second thoughts, I briskly turned and headed towards an apartment near my workplace. Actually, on the day I spotted Mike coming out of the hotel with a woman, I went straight to the real estate office in a rush. I wasn't necessarily resolved to divorce, but I had rented an apartment in advance just in case. While moving my belongings into the apartment, I thought to myself that it was a good decision. Then, I suddenly remembered something and took out my smartphone. I held the phone to my ear and waited for the impersonal voice guidance to begin. A few hours later, after settling down from the moving process and taking a break, I received a WhatsApp call. When I checked the caller ID, it read, Mike. I exhaled slowly, waited a moment, and then answered, Hello? Sophia, where are you right now? When I came home, it was completely empty, and my phone's been disabled. What's going on? All the stuff in the house was mostly mine to begin with, so I just took them. And the phone was under my name, that's why I cancelled it. I could hear his panic tone through the phone, but I calmly stated the facts. Wait, how are you even calling if your phone's not working? That's because I connected to Wi-Fi and managed to use only WhatsApp. But forget that, you took your things? You're not seriously running away from home, are you? This has to be a joke. Mike still seemed unable to grasp the situation, which only added to my irritation. Are you serious right now? Don't tell me you've forgotten about the call earlier today. No one can calmly work while their house is on fire, right? I tried to suppress the quiver of anger in my voice as I asked about something I had wanted to know for a long time, if not today. 
Instead of going to work, where and with whom were you spending your time? Mike gasped and fell silent at my question. After a brief pause, seemingly unable to withstand the silent pressure, Mike reluctantly began to speak. About that walk I mentioned earlier, I ran into a client by chance, that was a lie. It was actually a girl from work, and I was at her house today. The story Mike told was exactly what I had suspected. He had been involved with Anna, a receptionist at his office, for about six months. They had been meeting on nights when I was working late shifts. But recently, Anna had become more demanding, and Mike had lied about working overtime or being called in on days off to meet her. And today, they had both taken the day off to spend at Anna's house, only to learn about the fire at the company when her phone rang. After spilling everything, Mike still pleaded over the phone, please forgive me. I was disgusted. It's good that I finally got the truth out of you, Mike. It was a short marriage, but I did my best to build a good home. I could hear Mike saying, wait, over the phone, trying to hold me back, but I ignored it and spoke my piece. Please let's divorce due to your infidelity. We can discuss the alimony through lawyers. Goodbye. Mike seemed to want to say more, but facing my resolute attitude, he finally just muttered, okay. Later on, the fire at Mike's company was covered by the local news as it was significant enough to be reported. Watching the report, I was shocked to find out that the perpetrator was Mike's mistress, Anna. In the early morning, Anna had sneaked into the company's conference room, frayed the end of a curtain, and lit it with a lighter. The fire quickly spread across the entire curtain, and the conference room was completely destroyed. Fortunately, the building itself only suffered partial damage, but surveillance footage revealed Anna's act. Regarding the motive for the crime, Anna said, the married man I was seeing just wouldn't divorce his wife, and even threatening to expose our relationship to the company had no effect. I thought I had to do something this drastic. Honestly, I couldn't understand why she would want to commit a crime just to have Mike. However, according to Anna's co-worker, she would often lament, being alone is lonely, as part of her usual talk. Maybe she envied the married man who seemed to have everything, thinking that obtaining him would fill her own loneliness. Thinking this, I suddenly felt that feeling lonely even when you're with someone is far worse. After the divorce issue, there had been no direct contact with Mike, but the divorce proceedings were moving forward through lawyers. Amidst this, I heard about Mike's situation at his company. After the fire, Mike, who really knew nothing, was shocked to learn the truth of the incident from the company's HR. And then Anna was quickly arrested, and the news of their relationship spread throughout the company in no time. Colleagues at the company whispered about them. Unable to bear the gossip, Mike resigned from the company. Hearing about this whole sequence of events, I felt a bit of sympathy, but mostly I thought Mike got what he deserved for choosing another woman. With those feelings, I proceeded with the divorce proceedings dispassionately, and the divorce was finalized smoothly. Thanks to the photos of Mike's infidelity I had taken on my phone, everything went smoothly. Furthermore, the alimony was neatly paid out of Mike's severance pay. Now that my ties with Mike were completely severed, I was enjoying living on my own in my new apartment, which I had grown quite accustomed to. Perhaps I had been neglecting myself by always putting others first. While continuing my job as a nurse, I now took time for myself to enjoy cooking, which had been the greatest joy during my marriage to Mike. In the morning, I opened the windows of my apartment and let in the fresh air. Looking outside, I saw a family of three walking together, looking happy. Even seeing that, I felt no regret, but rather excitement for what lies ahead. Then, my phone buzzed, and returning to my room, I looked at the screen and couldn't help but smile. Someone I had connected with on my cooking social media account and I had hit it off and had become fast friends, and today we had planned to cook together. I replied to the message, I'll be there soon, and immediately started preparing for the day's cooking.